Okay, open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, verse 18. The second missionary journey comes to an end today as Paul leaves Corinth, goes to Ephesus back home. And we are arriving in the city of Ephesus, coming out of the city of Corinth. Ephesus is another huge city, hundreds of thousands of people, Asia Minor's most prominent city. So as we arrive in Ephesus, we're learning one more key base, Corinth and Ephesus, two of the key bases of missions and church planning in the first century. Where did the church come from? And how did it grow? That's the question that's being asked today. And what we're going to learn is that Jesus is alive. That's where the church came from. They went and told everybody the good news of the gospel. So we are going to see how to become bold witnesses in our day because Jesus is alive and the world needs to hear it from us. Okay, let's take a little tour here of Ephesus. I'm really getting into these videos here, so check it out. Here is a tour video of Ephesus that I found. These, like, 3D tours uh, online. Go ahead and play that video. Um, you can turn the volume down on that video, too. It's just background music. But Ephesus was a glorious city, port city, harbor city. Uh, and what you'll notice is, you know, in the Roman Empire, you've got, these are, like, small mud hut villages you know what i mean i mean like there's actually so much going on in the roman empire when it comes to civilization so paul arrived here from corinth and you look imagine walking these streets imagine seeing this city of ephesus for the first time and this is like when it comes to the impact the possible impact for the gospel there are so many people in this city a couple of interesting facts is the capital of Asia. Corinth was the capital of Greece. This is the capital of Asia. The governor of the entire province lives here. And one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in Ephesus. And we'll see that in just a second. But here's what like a house would look like if you were able to just walk around with Paul. There's a, a house and, you know, there's like three or four kind of condo houses all connected and so that would be what he kind of stayed in and as he walked around there'd be a marketplace plenty of governance going on commerce there are so many people here and he could uh, plant a church there were a lot of jews here too which is why he could go to the synagogue tell them about the messiah and then recruit them to go and make disciples also it's kind of mind-blowing just how much opportunity was here in this city and remember he was told not to go into these cities when he first passed through he's finally arriving here and now we see why, because this entire city was encircled by other missionary activity, and it uh, kind of provided a um, concentration of gospel impact, and so therefore it could, it could not only be reached by the surrounding areas, but it could go out and reach the surrounding areas as well. Now we are heading out of the city to the wonder of the ancient world, um, one of the ancient wonders of the world, which is the temple to the goddess Artemis, a.k.a. Diana in the Roman form, and that is Wonder Woman in our day, uh, the goddess temple to her honor. So what a magnificent, tremendous city. It's wealthy, strategic base for church planning because it's got a port, and it would be from this city that the gospel could indeed spread all over the ancient world. Ephesus would get a letter, and um, it's a great city for many reasons, but tradition holds that Luke the Apostle John and Mary Magdalene were all buried there um, after they passed. Wow, what a city! So we're going to arrive in Ephesus here. We're going to learn how to become bold witnesses through the example of the Apostle Paul. And the sermon really um, focuses on four people. And all the points come from how they contributed to the building up of the church. Let's pray, and then we'll get into Acts 18 together. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would use the gospel's impact in the city of Ephesus to show us that you are alive, that we should tell everyone the good news of the gospel. And Lord, we want to see fruit of that. Lord, next week we're launching our online site, findgodagain.com. We pray that you would use this as our way of telling our whole city that you're alive. And we pray that people would hear about this site. They would go to it. They would hear our stories and our testimonies and that you would help us to see a great awakening to the gospel in the city of Chicago just as there was one in Corinth, just as there was one in Ephesus, and ultimately in the entire Roman Empire. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, here we are, Acts 18, verse 18. It says this, After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. With him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sancreia, he had his 
he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next, through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So right there is the end of the second missionary journey, and then the beginning of the third. Okay, the first thing you can write down we see in Paul's life is this. Number one, Paul established the church in Ephesus. Basically, the first whole point is he established another church in Ephesus, and then he moved on, and then he went to visit other churches that he had established. Paul is a great example of how the church spread and grew in the first century. It was spirit-led. As I said a moment ago, he was told not to go into this area. Hundreds of miles of no led him into another area, and he finally circled back around, and he came into this region. So it was a spirit-led effort to plant these new churches. Now, when it comes to seeing that, we understand that some of you right now are waiting and you don't know why God has said wait. No, not yet. Keep moving. Well, this is a, this is a moment in Scripture where we see God's wisdom. He did want Paul to end up in the city, but he wanted him to get there after the entire region was encircled by the gospel. Remember, God says, says that his ways are not your ways and his thoughts are not your thoughts. So take heart. If God is telling you to wait, know, or to keep moving when you want to stop, trust him. He knows much better than you do. Paul established the church in Ephesus. How did he do it? Write this down. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews in verse 19. And we know from the context that that means he reasoned with them about Jesus, the gospel, and he used the scripture, the Old Testament scriptures, to show them Jesus was the Messiah. He preached the gospel. Paul himself also was proof Jesus is alive. You know his story was recorded in the book of Acts. He was the chief opponent to the gospel. He tried to destroy the church. He went house to house, finding Christians, forcing them to say Jesus is Lord, then he would either throw them in jail or kill them. Then he saw a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus. He got saved. Jesus called him into his service and then sent him out to the rest of the world to tell people about Christ. Here's what's so interesting. Before Paul was a Christian, he tried to force people to say Jesus is Lord so he could kill them. Now that he's a Christian, he tries to tell people to say Jesus is Lord so he can save them. He's doing the exact same thing, but this man has been radically transformed. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has a broken heart for the Jews. Even though he got hunted down by them, almost killed, the Jews followed him from city to city. He still went into the synagogue in Romans, he unpacks this. He, has, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for my brothers, the Jews, who are not saved. Last week, we talked about having a broken heart for the lost, and Paul is still reaching out to the Jews, even though they're defying the Savior. So when it comes to this idea of a vow, did you see that? What is that all about? It says he had his hair cut in Sancreia, for he was under a vow. It doesn't explain it very much, so we can only guess what was going on here, but a few things in the context as to why Luke might include it. Uh, he had a really good experience in the synagogue when he went there in Ephesus, and maybe it's because he showed them that he was still uh, adopting a form of piety in the Old Testament that still applied to New Testament Christians. You could take a vow to show gratitude. Uh, you could take a, a, a vow to set yourself apart for something, to make a specific request to God, a Nazarite vow. So these vows were for gratitude, worship, consecration, whatever the reason, we're not told. Maybe those Jews saw that this was a devout man of God who knew his Old Testament, was once likely on or near the Sanhedrin. Um, so maybe that is included to show part of why he had a good experience which is rare in Ephesus. It also could tell us about his travel plans. Some of the vows had to be finalized in Jerusalem. He may have had to even take his hair that he cut there and burn it there. For whatever reason, he was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. Also, the seaports would close, but maybe it's because of this vow that he wanted to keep things brief in Ephesus and keep going, but that's included in the text. So we had to cover that. So he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he had a powerful story that others couldn't believe. 
This is a man of God. This is a person who knew his Old Testament. He got saved. He was going the wrong way. He turned around, and now he's traveling around the world to tell people about Jesus. So my question for you at this very moment is, if he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, do you understand the gospel, and have you believed it? Have you been born again by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? This is where the church came from. And this is man's only hope. The gospel is good news, but first there's really bad news that you have to admit, that you've sinned, broken God's law, you deserve judgment, you won't get to heaven because you're a good person, you won't get to heaven because you're a religious person, you'll only get to heaven if you are a saved person. Only saved people go to heaven, and that is the good news. So Jesus came down, Christmas, right, from heaven, angels sang at his birth, he lived the perfect life, He died on the cross. There he paid the penalty for all of your sins. Then he was thrown in the tomb. On the third day he rose again, and therefore he has victory over the grave. He uh, he, uh, was risen up to heaven, where he now has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's been promised since the Old Testament that he will rule a kingdom that will never end. Therefore, heaven is not your personal playground or paradise. You don't get to walk around in lands and your little mansion to your own desires. Heaven is his kingdom, not yours. And therefore, you have to trust in him. He will save you. He will bring you into his kingdom if you confess that you have sinned. That's the gospel. So are you a saved person? Have you asked Jesus to save you once and for all? If not, today can be the day. That's the gospel that Paul preached That's the gospel you must believe. Write this down. Then he planted a church that gathered and grew. He preached the gospel. He planted a church. There were likely already Christians around. They were likely already gathering, but this consolidated the effort. And he, when he came to town, he started grabbing people from the fringe areas and bringing them together. He was centralizing this effort. This is what he did as an apostle and a church planter. He planted a church that gathered and grew. And so he left people there, Priscilla and Aquila. They're kind of point two, so we'll get to them in a second. And then he went into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and then he left them there to form this church. We find out more about how it turned out in the letters and in this third missionary journey. We learn that the church is made up of people who repent, believe the gospel, and are baptized as a profession of their faith. They meet for worship, Bible instruction, under the shepherding authority of the local elders that are put in charge. And the church is the place where God's presence lives and moves in power. And boy, there are going to be powerful things happening in Ephesus when Paul gets back. Some of the most incredible demonstrations of power ever recorded in Scripture are going to happen in this city, but just not yet. He planted a church that gathered and grew. And the church was made up of people from every walk of life. High class, low class, Jew, Gentile, Greek, Roman, men and women, children. They were, the church was made up of a melting pot of civilization, which was very rare to find uh, in the very divided ancient world. So he planted a church that gathered and grew. When it comes to being a church, we, we're actually a church plant. And we celebrate our birthday next weekend. Our 14th birthday celebration is next weekend. Church planting is the way the church grew. There are plenty of missionary ways to go and spread the gospel, and we support many of them, but church planting is the original, the primary way the gospel spread in the New Testament. That's why we are a church planting church. We've helped to plant churches all over the world, and we've specifically done a lot of work in Romania. We helped to launch a church in Ukraine, Pastor Alex. We launched out a church in New York, Pastor Brandon, and we've strengthened churches out of Arad and Romania. We've helped churches to launch in many states. And so we are committed to church planting, and we see here in the Bible that this is how the gospel spread. Uh, An apostle would go out and bring their believers together, install local elders, and then they would go and reach their region. So he planted a church that gathered and grew. And then write this down. He strengthened disciples through teaching and encouragement. He planted a church, then he strengthened disciples through teaching and encouragement. He stayed for a year and a half in Corinth, and then he would come back to Ephesus for about three years. On his trip, he would pass back through churches from the missionary journey number one, his first missionary journey. Then he would visit some from the second missionary journey. That's coming up starting next week. As he would go back through these churches, he would give them teaching, wisdom, encouragement, and that's how the churches were strengthened. We have a map here of the second missionary journey, just to recap what he's been through. And what you find is he's had an 18-city trip all over, and it was about AD 52. 
So about an 18-city trip happened, and you can track the map here. Now, some of you have remarked to me that when I put a map up here, you have a little trouble seeing the lines. And somebody actually bought me a laser pointer so I could help those of you with aging eyes to see what I'm talking about. And he bought me like the brightest laser pointer on the internet. So here we go. Uh, yeah, this, this, this is a multi-tool. If you start falling asleep, I'm going to put this right on your forehead. So watch out, okay? So can, can you see that? So he started in Jerusalem, then he went up here through Damascus, his hometown of Tarsus, up through the, this is the first missionary journey. He was told, no, 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 do not stop, keep going, hundreds of miles of no. Then he arrived in Philippi, where there was a great earthquake, uh, Thessalonica, Berea, down here to Athens, and then he stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, didn't go to Sparta, boy, wouldn't that have been cool if he did, and then over to Ephesus, where he just stopped by for a second, and then he went back down to Caesarea, Jerusalem, uh, and then up into Syria. So this is the second missionary journey, and it's now complete. Okay, so uh, he planted a church that gathered and grew. Then he strengthened disciples through teaching and encouragement. Paul was a church planter, and he was a church strengthener. How did the church launch? Through the gospel of Jesus Christ people getting born again and then gathering. How did it grow stronger? Through the teaching and testimony of the apostles and those with teaching gifts. Paul would share his wisdom and encouragement through his letters. He wrote most of the New Testament. Thirteen books of the New Testament uh, were letters. His writings would, would fill this New Testament, and therefore his letters are strengthening and encouraging us today. Many of his letters were written when he finally got thrown in prison. He wouldn't, he wouldn't slow down, wouldn't stop. He got thrown in jail. You know, what am I going to do? Well, then he started writing letters to all these churches. So he strengthened the disciples through teaching and encouragement. That is how the church grows strong. He taught them about community. He taught them about the Bible, how to grow in love, how to grow in truth. And that's how our church will grow strong also. As we head into the fall, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to have a spiritual growth plan. That plan should include your own personal growth goals, like what are you going to read in the Bible this, this fall? Are you going to memorize scripture? What's, what's your plan? And if I were to come up to you and to say, what's your spiritual growth plan this fall? And you're just like, oh, well, you still have time. <laughs> Before next Sunday, you should have a plan. I might ask you that next week. I might be like, hey, what's your fall spiritual growth plan? But then you have to have a plan in community. You have to have some way of connecting in group life because if you're just isolated and all alone, the enemy's going to be able to pick you off really easily, right? So get involved in a group. Get involved in a women's Bible study Wednesday morning or Wednesday night. Get involved in a small group or come to Anchor Bible Institute Monday nights to grow in your Bible knowledge. What is your community plan? And I have to say, if you've been out of group life for a while, your plan is a really bad plan. There has to be a way, a place for you to get plugged into group life. I know you could be busy. I know you have all these commitments, but there is a way to do it. And if you don't do it, the longer you go without community, the more and the harder it's going to be when God brings correction into your life because you can't do the Christian life alone. You cannot do the Christian life alone. So just get rid of all the excuses and get plugged in and get growing this fall. Paul established the church in Ephesus. He preached the gospel. He planted a church that gathered and grew, and he strengthened the disciples through teaching and encouragement. Imagine that missions report when he got back home. Oh, I went through evil. God wouldn't let me stop. I arrived in Philippi. There was an earthquake. The jailer got saved. Then I went to Athens. It was amazing. Took the tour. Then I went to yeah, Corinth. I know. And then I went through Ephesus, and now I'm back. Missionary journey complete. Okay, let's move on to the next characters who give us a portrait of bold witnessing. Number two, Priscilla and Aquila. They devoted themselves to ministry. Priscilla and Aquila devoted themselves to ministry. Look back at uh, verse 18. It says, with him were Priscilla and Aquila. So they came with him now. Do you remember their story? They were originally kicked out of Rome, and then they started uh, planting a church in Corinth with the Apostle Paul, and now they're on tour with him. They're like, let's go. And so their lives have been radically redirected. 
So let's talk about them a little bit. It's unusual a few times Priscilla's name is mentioned before her husband. We don't exactly know why that is, but we know that she is a strong, godly, spiritual leader who gave her life to ministry with her husband. Together they model ministry sacrifice for us. When it comes to her being named first, there's a possibility that she may have been from more of an upper-class family. It could have been that she took initiative spiritually and was saved first, or maybe even had a gifting that placed her in more of a place of prominence. We're really not sure. But it's awesome that together they allowed God to use them, and they both model for us a godly, spiritual, strong woman, godly, spiritual, strong man, in a healthy Christian marriage, deciding to go through great changes that the kingdom might be built up. They give us a wonderful portrait of spiritual leadership. Too often Christians aim low when it comes to church involvement. Often when life gets hard, when the schedule gets tight, they try to do less and the church is the first thing that gets cut. Last Sunday morning, less ministry, less group life. Something's got to give and it's church that gets cut. Well, boy, do they give us an example of actually saying, give me more, give me more, give me more. I want to do more. I want to go places. I want to reach people. Help me to do more. They're not aiming low. Too often Christians don't plan to exert a lot of energy for spiritual things. So therefore, they don't do a lot. Often Christians don't give a lot to church ministry or to the kingdom of God. Sometimes they don't even give anything to the mission of Christ. And therefore, they don't have that partnership with God in the gospel. What an example we have here of a couple who've determined together that they are going to really go all in in reaching their world for Christ. Their devotion should inspire us to give more, to do more, to serve more, to be here more, to reach more people. Let's raise that bar. Priscilla and Aquila devoted themselves to ministry. Jot this down. They worked hard to support themselves in the church. They worked hard to support themselves in the church. They were tent makers, which is a hard-working industry. Therefore, they had, to, they had to toil and sweat throughout the day. They had a day job. And as they traveled, they continued to work. And so they traveled, and they worked, and then they, after work was done, devoted themselves to church leadership. When it comes to most believers today and then, they, they had a real job. They put in all those hours throughout the week, and then church was their devotion, their delight. And they invested their time and their energy in making disciples once the shop was closed. They likely had the gift of giving because they uh, were people of means, and they also, therefore, propelled ministry ahead. When it comes to how a church grows strong, the same was true back then as it is today. Uh, most of God's people are sent out into the secular world, and that is your mission field. And you work hard, you put in a full uh, week's work if you're out there in the, in the working world, and then you, you give of your tithes and your offerings, and then you find a ministry you want on a Sunday uh, or Wednesday night, or you, know, you work in the kids' ministry Sunday morning, you sign up for the student ministry or serve on the tech team, you kind of find, once job's done, how do I get to work for Christ? And there's a joy in that. They worked hard to support themselves uh, and the church. That's how the ministry is propelled forward, because people like them said yes to giving generously, to serving with a lot of time, it truly multiplied the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He wasn't alone. He had plenty of support, resources, and people around him. And when people say yes to give and to go, the gospel impact is amplified. Priscilla and Aquila give us a great example of being devoted to gospel ministry. They worked hard to support themselves in the church. Write this down. They surrendered their geography to God. They surrendered their geography to God. So remember, they were shagged out of Rome because there was persecution to the Jews, likely because of Jesus Christ. So all the Jews were kicked out of Rome by Claudius. Here's a picture of Rome that we have. Uh, we can put that up there. This was, this, was, this was home. What a wonderful, glorious, beautiful city. And to live there, they likely were somebody. They likely had people around. And then boom, all of them got kicked out of Rome they ended up in Corinth, which is like, yuck, sin city. They likely didn't want to be there, but they met Paul, planted a church. Now they're in the Bible, and they're going around the world with Paul, 
making disciples. How amazing is that? They surrendered their geography to God. They would travel to Ephesus. We find out later in letters that they would go back to Rome in the book of Romans and they would launch a church back in their home when they were welcomed back, but they didn't stay there. They went back to Ephesus with Timothy. So they kept traveling and saying yes. When it comes to being partners of church plants, uh, they said, here I am, send me. And maybe, maybe you've been able to say that before. Maybe you have been able to say, here I am, send me. Maybe you've gone on a short-term mission trip. Maybe you have gone on a longer-term mission trip or studied abroad. Whatever it is, maybe you have been able to support the mission's effort directly. They went places that were not easy. They accepted discomfort, inconvenience, and uncertainty. What great examples they were. I remember when we opened up before COVID a, a mission trip into Romania and Ukraine. One of the first women to sign up was over 70 years old. And at the time, Pastor Mark, who was in charge of missions, he's now in Scotland, said, I'm going to have to talk to her because I don't know if she's going to be able to keep up. And she just laughed at him and said, I've been a missionary my whole life. I won't have any trouble. And sure enough, they were having trouble keeping up with her. She was ahead of the game, up early, couldn't wait to serve the Lord. We were doing kids camps over there. What a role model she was to the rest of the team. It was really funny when she got um, flagged in the airport by the drug dog. They had a lot of fun for that. And uh, <laughs> there she is getting patted down. She didn't care. She had made a habit a long time ago of saying yes not know when opportunities to do more came up. And really, if you're younger, I'm middle, right? If you're younger or middle like me, the more you say yes when a gospel opportunity comes up to give, to go, to serve, the more likely you will be to say yes as your life progresses. And the more you say no when an opportunity to do more, to be inconvenienced comes up, the more you make it a habit of saying no, the more you're going to say no as you get older because life doesn't get any easier or more comfortable as you age. What an example Priscilla and Aquila are, and this woman who went on a mission trip with our church, they surrendered their geography to God. And I wonder if you have surrendered your geography to God. I wonder if you are okay with where he has you right now, if you are going to bloom where you are planted. I wonder if you will say, Lord, here I am, send me while I'm here, I will go. And I wonder if there's an opportunity that comes up for you to say yes to inconvenience, to go, to give, to serve at a higher level. I wonder if you are willing to say, here I am, send me. Write this down. They modeled sacrifice, service, and leader development. They modeled sacrifice, service, and leader development. We're going to read on a little bit here. So there they are, staying in Ephesus. And then Paul goes, and now they're without him. In verse 24, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So that was John the Baptist. Perhaps he um, only knew the truth about Jesus from those early stages. Uh, he lived far away in Egypt and Alexandria. There, there was something incomplete about his understanding of Jesus. We don't know if it was Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. We don't know what it is. <coughs> but he was a Christian. He was saying right things, but he only had the baptism of John. So he hadn't been uh, crossed over fully into the full understanding of Christ. So it says here, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When he had wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So we'll get to Apollos in a second, but... Um, Priscilla and Aquila here, they take him aside and they're like, okay, you are like 95% right. <laughs> but there's a couple things we got to tell you, okay? We spent a year and a half with Paul, so we know a few things. And they kind of set him straight and he received that. But they were, now, they were now challenging, instructing, growing leaders, developing leaders so that they can serve at a higher level. So they modeled sacrifice, service, and leader development. Just to close out, Priscilla and Aquila, Paul says later they risked their lives for the gospel, likely on the third missionary journey when Ephesus explodes in a riot. 
Paul says Ephesus was nasty. He says it felt like he was fighting wild beasts in that city. And in 2 Corinthians, he said in that area, he despaired of life. They all thought they were going to die. And they stood firm. They didn't bolt. What a great couple. This is what spiritual maturity looks like. Yes to more sacrifice, more surrender, more generosity. Yes, Jesus. And they challenge us to take on tougher assignments to support and grow leaders, to strengthen the church, and to stand firm when all hope seems to be lost. This is how the church was built. Number one, Paul established the church in Ephesus. Number two, Priscilla and Aquila devoted themselves to ministry. Number three, let's talk about Apollos. Apollos preached and defended the gospel. I love this part because he's an evangelist, an apologist, and I love apologetics. Apollos was um, from Alexandria, which is a giant university city in Egypt. He believed in Jesus. There were missing pieces. He was kind of set straight through Priscilla and Aquila, and that's wonderful. So he started lighting it up in Ephesus. Then he went to Corinth and started lighting it up there. He made such an impact that the Corinthians would put him on par with Paul and Peter. There's some people who even suggest that Apollos could have written a book of the Bible like Hebrews if he wanted to, but we don't know who wrote that book. He was articulate and very impactful, and so we see in him a speaking gift. Uh, in the church, there are speaking gifts, there are serving gifts, and then there are a combination of the two. Apollos has a wonderful speaking gift, and we see how that built up the church. Jot this down. He was a gifted evangelist apologist. He was a gifted evangelist apologist. He shared the gospel, and he defended it. Apologetics doesn't mean saying sorry, it means to give a defense for the faith that we have. And apologetics is a very powerful form of evangelism. It's when you can debate other worldviews, and the Bible says we are to destroy every argument, take captive every thought that Jesus might be loved and adored. Of course, we must never be unloving, but like prophets of old, some people zealously debate other worldviews. They're very much truth people. They can dismantle faulty worldviews, and those are apologists. And so we have a picture here of several apologists. If you are really interested in learning how to defend your faith, to reason, to debate, these are a bunch of people who are really awesome, and you should read their works. You've got William Lane Craig. I was saved through an apologetic way, and I read, a lot, I read William Lane Craig's books early in my evangelistic period, and he, was, he helped me to have a mind that understood the faith. Nancy Piercy, Norm Geisler, Josh McDowell, of course, evidence that demands a verdict, case for Christ, C.S. Lewis, um, you know, the Narnia, he did more than Narnia, wrote great books, A Mere Christianity is awesome, John Lennox is a brilliant Oxford scholar, and he writes books, um, he's actually a mathematician, but he also is an apologist, Lisa Fields, um, and then Lee Strobel, uh, Lee Strobel, Case for Christ, and so all of these authors I would commend to you, and if you want to grow in your understanding rationally of the faith, I would check them out. If you've never seen apologetics happen, it's very powerful because um, they go into university, they go to Cambridge, they go to, they go to Harvard, they go to Oxford, they go to these places, they go on their turf and they debate their ideas with their foremost scholars. So I'm going to show you a clip of the very end of a debate between um, Christopher Hitchens and William Lane Craig. Christopher Hitchens is one of the four horsemen of the new atheism. And in this video, you will just hear the very end of what Christopher Hitchens was saying. He's basically saying you don't need God. God has poisoned everything and religion is worthless. And then William Lane Craig has to get up and share his closing thoughts. So check out this real quick snippet of how this debate ended. Uh, how, should we, how should we deal with the, the base of what Darwin called the, 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 the lowly stamp of our original origins, which comes uh, not from a, a pact with the devil, or an original sin, but from our evolution as well. All these questions, ladies and gentlemen, would remain exactly the same. Emancipate yourself from the idea of a celestial dictatorship, and you've taken the first step to becoming free. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hitchens seems to fail to recognize that atheism is itself a worldview, and it claims alone to be true, and all the other religions of the world false. It is no more tolerant than Christianity, with respect to these other views, he asserts that he alone has the true worldview, atheism. The only problem is he doesn't have any arguments for this worldview. He just asserts it. So it seems to me 
that we, if you're going to have a worldview and champion it tonight, you've got to come to a debate prepared to give some arguments, and we haven't heard any. And just imagine being in that situation, right? But when you've got a mind that's been so sharp, and you can listen all, all debate long. Christopher Hitchens was very articulate, and he can take you around the world, throughout history, point out all of these shocking stories. But in the end, William Craig gets up there and says, maybe you didn't catch this, but he presented zero arguments to become an atheist tonight. It was just all, I don't like this, I don't like this, I don't think this is right. He presented no arguments whatsoever to become an atheist. And William Lane Craig called him out. He's like, you got to do better than that. Come on, this is a debate. It's really awesome. If you haven't watched any debates, there are some great ones out there. Um, so you can Google William Lane Craig debate. You can um, Google John Lennox. Uh, he debated Richard Dawkins on the God Delusion. They, of course, both teach at Oxford. Really awesome stuff. You can Google, um, there's, there's many different debates out there. But uh, he was a gifted evangelist apologist. This is what apologetics is like. And it says here in verse 28, he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So this was him debating the religious folk about whether or not Jesus was Lord, and he powerfully did it in public. That's what it felt like. Write this down. He was highly educated, and he knew his Bible. He was highly educated, and he knew his Bible. He came from Alexandria, University City. He was an eloquent man, it says in verse 24, learned competent in scriptures. He knew his Bible. He knew his Bible. Maybe you feel challenged to learn your Bible at a higher level. Uh, maybe you should come to Anchor Bible Institute this fall, every Monday night, to learn the Gospel of John. And maybe you can study the Bible at a higher level. Several people in our church have, um, have taken online courses through Moody Bible Institute. They want a seminary level understanding of scripture. Maybe you're feeling called to go to Bible college, to become a minister or an evangelist or a speaker or a church planner, whatever it is, there are some people who are called to get educated in Scripture at the highest level. He was highly educated and he was competent in the Scriptures. It says in verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in spirit, so he was a powerful communicator. Remember, there's a paradox in Scripture when it comes to being fervent or, or, or growing in your teaching gift, the Bible, when it says two opposite things, that's called a paradox. Paul says, I didn't preach Christ in an eloquent way, not with the wisdom of man, right? I just presented it that you might be saved. Uh, so there is no value when it comes to eloquence or persuasion when it comes to the simple truth that the gospel alone saves. But that doesn't mean that preachers, teachers in the first century just got up there and just said the Bible because they did not want to be at all eloquent. No, they were eloquent. They did, they did try to persuade people and speak in powerful ways, but they didn't rely on that. They didn't lean on that. They didn't decide that that is what they were going to be about. So he's commended here for being fervent in spirit, articulate, competent in scriptures, highly educated. Do you need to be highly educated? Do you need to know your Bible to be an effective witness? No, no you don't. But it's commended in Scripture when you are, and some are called and gifted in that area. Verse 26, he spoke boldly in the synagogue. He was a truth person, right? And it says in verse 27, uh, he went to Corinth, right? And then he lit it up there, and he, he, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews. Listen to all these describing words. Bold, powerful, competent, fervent. This is a speaking gift, and the church was built up by gifts like this. So sometimes people think that you have to turn off your brain to become a Christian. You just have to believe it all by faith. You know, go back to the dark ages. Uh, that's absolutely not true. This was a highly educated man who knew his world and knew his Bible, and he could debate and show you that the Christian faith could be defended. And we need people today, especially young people, if you're in college, if you're in high school, you need to know that the Christian faith has a long history of being defensible. Your hard questions can be asked in this building, and you can find satisfying answers. You can learn to defend and explain your faith. Christianity has, in fact, satisfied some of the brightest minds in all of history. You don't have to become a dullard. You don't have to turn off your brain to be a Christian. Sometimes people just say, well, I believe in science, not faith, as if it's one or the other. There are actually people who are 
among the most brilliant scientists and mathematicians alive who firmly believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When John Lennox began as a student, I can't remember if it was Cambridge or Oxford or where it was, but he had a lot of promise. He was very bright, very brilliant, and would become one of those who's at the head of his field. And a bunch of professors took him into a side room very early on, sat him down, and said, you must leave behind this notion of religion right now or you will never go anywhere in this field. And he looked up at them, this, this Irish guy with a, with a fire in his eyes, and he said, well, what better do you have for me than what I've already got? And they said, well, nothing. And he said, then I'll stick with what I got. He was not intimidated. He was not intimidated by their ultimatum. He stuck with Christ. He has risen up all the way through teaching at Oxford Mathematics, and he's one who debated, uh, he debated Richard Dawkins. So he didn't let go of his faith. He said, in fact, that moment put steel in his spine because he called their bluff and they had nothing for him. It's very powerful for a young man to stand his ground. So don't be intimidated. You don't have to become unintelligent to be a Christian. Finally, write this down. Apollos, that's a great example. He was humble and teachable, yet bold and fearless. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, he, he didn't say to them, oh, who do you think you are? I'm from Alexandria. You don't tell me I'm teaching something wrong. He was correctable. We know the Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So he stayed focused on loving truth, loving Christ, loving others, and therefore he was very humble. Hey, maybe God is calling you to become a teacher or a writer, someone who can communicate forcefully, directly, intelligently, and passionately about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe God is developing, prompting you to develop your communication skills. Everyone can share their faith in Christ, but maybe you have a speaking gift or a writing gift, and maybe Apollos can inspire you to truly develop that gift to its fullest potential. Well, hey, this is how the church was built. Paul established the church in Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila devoted themselves to ministry, and Apollos preached and defended the gospel. I would love for you to surrender, to become a bold witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how you serve, no matter how you speak, this is how the world is turned upside down. Hey, based on all of this, let's go to the Lord in prayer and close out. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this first stop in Ephesus, and we'll be back. I thank you for these people who model to us what it means to be bold witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the Apostle Paul who got saved because he was going the wrong way, a religious guy. And Lord, I think there are some here today or some who are watching online, and they have never repented of their sin once and for all. They've never turned from their selfishness admitted that your judgment falls rightly upon them. They've never asked Jesus to save them. And I pray that as they hear the gospel today, they would cry out, Jesus, save me. And thank you for Priscilla and Aquila. They kept saying yes. Lord, we're so tempted, especially after COVID, especially after life got crazy, to say no. No to community. No to personal spiritual growth no to doing harder things for the gospel, to serving on a ministry team. When life gets overwhelming, so many Christians right now are saying, no, no, no. They're serving less, they're giving less, they're telling others about Christ less. And I pray that some would repent of that today. And as they see Priscilla and Aquila surrendering their geography, going from place to place, uprooted, so joyful, standing their ground when they almost die in this city, Lord. I just pray that you would challenge us to develop that pattern of saying yes. Yes to showing up to church on Sunday. Yes to getting involved in a ministry team. Yes to making it to small group. Lord, I just pray that you would challenge people today to not say no, but to say yes. That's how the world was turned upside down. Wake us up, O oh Lord, to the opportunities all around us. And I pray, Lord, just like Apollos, there are some who are gifted, called to be communicators of the gospel, teachers, writers, evangelists, apologists. Lord, fan that, that gift into flame in their hearts and help them to see what a fully formed communicator looks like in Apollos. Humble, teachable, fervent, bold, and may they develop that gift to the fullest potential. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name.